Welcome to App Center, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Chun Wang. He is the founder and CEO of Stakefish. Uh, Stakefish is one of the leading proof of stake companies and validators. He's also the founder of a company called f 2 Pro, which is one of the biggest Bitcoin mining pools uh, still today and has been for a long time. So he's kind of very unique in having been both part of this, you know, running proof of work infrastructure as well as proof of stake infrastructure. So really excited to speak with Chun Wang about this. So just before we get started, uh, a few words from our sponsors. So first of all, we have the Gnosis Safe. So the Gnosis Safe is a smart wallet that allows you to control digital assets with much more granular permissions. Uh, you can use multiple private keys and use just a subset to approve transactions. They can be stored on different devices, software, hardware wallets, even across multiple people. So it's the, become the most trusted Web3 asset management solution for individuals, teams, and DAOs. And there's more than $70 billion worth of digital assets, you know, uh, secured with the Gnosis Safe. And then we also have TallyHo. So TallyHo is redefining the wallet as a public good. So you can think of it as a community-owned alternative to MetaMask. And it's a full, yeah, fully community-owned and operated, and it's a sort of the first wallet that's also a DAO. And their commitment to community ownership goes beyond just a wallet. So they also sponsor EtherJS, an open source JavaScript library, and they also committed 2.5% of their tokens to a Gitcoin aqueduct. So you can go to Tallyho, that's T-A-L-L-Y-H-O dot cash, and try out the community edition and uh, play around with its features. And then finally, we have Stake Wallet. So Stake Wallet is in your new favorite uh, mobile wallet, uh, as you can deduct from the name and kind of related to our conversation today. They're especially focusing on providing a great user experience for staking that's kind of unified across chains. And in just a few taps, you can stake and manage assets across 22 built-in protocols, including all the major EVMs, AL2s, and chains like Cosmos, Solana, Near, and more. And they've also started adding some other things in there like Liquid, AVAX, Solana, and Matic staking, and lots more things coming. And they also have multi-chain NFT support now. So you can go and download Stake Wallet on iOS or Android. Now, steak is spelled like the meat you eat, not like the thing normally people do, uh, staking, so S-T-E-A-K, or you go to the website stakewallet.fi. And with that, let's get to our conversation. Joan, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us today. So tell us, first of all, wh where, are you, uh, where are you calling in from? Yeah, I'm from uh, Longyearbyen, uh, Swarbart. It's an uh, Arctic island. And uh, yes, yeah, the uh, weather is great. And uh, I just uh, have to close my curtain because uh, it's super bright, but it's a uh, great view outside. And we have about 24 hours sun, and uh, uh, it's wonderful living here. So did you, you, cause I was reading and learning that like, you know, you're traveling across the world and have been doing for a while, but are you now settled in this Arctic island up there? I'm trying to settle everywhere, but maybe, yeah, there's a uh, quite a, you know, strong preference. Like uh, if I were settled down, I'd probably uh, strong consider uh, settled down here. So what, 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 what attracts you about this? Cause I have never heard anyone say like, okay, I would really like to settle down on like some tiny remote island near the, uh, the Arctic. Yeah. That's the second best place on the earth. And only after uh, Antarctica, because, uh, you know, few dozen countries are uh, signed in the 20s, uh, uh, 1960s, and which forbids uh, uh, people living in Antarctica. So, um, yeah, if uh, uh, that makes Swarbert the, the, you know, the best uh, practical place, uh, if you value, you know, uh, political neutral, and uh, you should definitely try it out. So it, it's because it, but it's not its own country, right? You said it was part of Norway. Yeah, it's part of Norway, but there's a treaty system signed in 1925, which uh, allowed like people from all the uh, nationalities, they must be treated as uh, same uh, as uh, Norwegians. You don't need a visa, you don't need work visa to you know you just uh, 
come and uh, yeah, you can do like uh, local Norwegians. I must say there's no local people here because uh, uh, it's not allowed to get born here. So everyone is coming from elsewhere. And then how many people live up there? Uh, here in town, like more than 2,000 people, something maybe 2,500. Okay, so it's this like tiny, tiny bunch of uh, sort of eccentric people who like ended up up there. Or, like what kind of people uh, are staying there? Yeah, it's not tiny anymore. It's uh, more than 2,000 people, quite a sizable town. Yesterday I went in here, like uh, where uh, Russians and uh, Ukrainians, they, they're living peaceful together. Uh, that town has uh, currently, they have a uh, little bit more than 200 people. And uh, it's about uh, 50 kilometers away from here. Um, yeah, compared to that, uh, Long Airbnb is quite uh, big, I must say. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, actually, I kind of want to come back to something uh, related, I guess, later in the, spa in the episodes, because you talked about like space travel. But let's, let's, let's go back and, and start a little bit in the beginning. I mean, you've been involved in crypto for like a long time. Can you tell us like, what inspired you initially? Like, how did you get involved in the crypto space? Initially, I was a contributor to SETI at Home, which was using radio telescopes to collect the, uh, signals, trying to find aliens from a, a signal received by a radio telescopes. And by doing that, you contribute to your computing power uh, from your personal computer spare time. And uh, one day I read about uh, Bitcoin from Slashdot, and uh, I learned about it using one night, and uh, I left my laptop running Bitcoin full node, trying to uh, mine something out. But uh, I, second second morning, it turned out uh, zero balance on my wallet. So I went to a local market to grab the two GPUs. That was year two, uh, 20, 2011. And since then, I never uh, stopped, uh, you know, uh, technically, the miner, uh, but uh, I only personally mine Bitcoin uh, in the first uh, two years. Personally, like you know, uh, using GPUs, uh, later FPGA A6, but uh, I stopped mining uh, myself uh, in 2013. Uh, but started a mining pool, and people contribute mining powers to the mining pool. Basically, I'm running the server side. It uh, depends on uh, how you define uh, Bitcoin mining. Uh, if you're using a strict uh, definition, I'm no longer a miner. So what, what, was, what, did you, what was your kind of idea? Like, what was your vision for F2 pool? Where did you want to take it? I think, you know, uh, just to say the latest development, uh, we all know like uh, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, Ethereum is going to change to POS pretty soon. Uh, we don't know when, but uh, I think uh, probably that's a matter of a month. So after that, we'll only see like how many coins we have. Currently, actually, we have 20 different uh, uh, coins, you know, but uh, there's uh, very few uh, innovations and development in the POW side. So basically, I think after Ethereum become a POS, basically, we are after pool become a Bitcoin company. So uh, if I foresee anything at the pool side, I think, uh, yeah, we'll almost uh, become a pure Bitcoin company in the next uh, year. Now that you've been involved in pre-OS as well as proof of, of work, I'm curious, like when you compare uh, proof of work and mining pool versus a, a, the proof of stake validators, what are the biggest differences between those two? Mm, to me, actually, it's quite similar. But a lot of other our team members, they probably have other idea. But to me, it's a very, very same thing. Uh, uh, just secure the blockchain, create new blocks. You know, uh, especially on Ethereum. Ethereum will become uh, currently is running POW, and after pool takes the responsibility to secure Ethereum network. And later on, because Ethereum become POS, it's a state fish uh, in charge of this. So what we're doing, like uh, after pool and state fish, they very similar and kind of the same thing. Right, right. But like there are obviously differences. So I'm curious, like what, what do you think are the most important differences sort of in, in terms of like running it as a company and, and like, yeah. The difference, uh, I think that's, that's, that's a little bit much into the, the, the details. 
like uh, you know how you handle miners, how you handle uh, incoming hash rate, and how you handle like validators. Uh, miners, you, at least you know some uh, uh, where they're from because you have the IP address. Uh, but Stakefish, you you have you have absolutely no you know no no idea who your uh, uh, stakers they are. You know, so they're. Yeah, in terms of a product design, I think there for sure there's some uh, differences. But uh, for me, like I try to like see them as uh, similar way. I I try to like uh, uh, see more the uh, you know what you know the the share you know what the similarity like they share rather than the different uh, uh, from each other. There are probably some chance like uh, later you see like. Uh, the two company maybe <laughs> they work very closely together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I mean, I think that is the big, the big similarity, right? Is okay. You're like checking transactions, producing a block, like securing the chain, right? So there's there's a lot of those similarities. But I'm kind of like you run the full you you connect to other P2P network, uh, and you join the governance. Let's talk about Stakefish, right? So I, I remember, you know, uh, in, I guess, you know, because I, I used to be part of the Tendermint team and then I started Course 1, right? So I was part of the the Game of Stakes back then, right? The, the Cosmos, original Cosmos test net. And, and uh, you guys were, Stakefish was like very active in there. It was doing like an, an excellent job, you know, one could tell that like, okay, these people already have, I came with a whole bunch of experience that I think others didn't have. But tell us a little bit, like how, how did you, how did you start Stakefish? Like what was the initial? <laughs> I, I must say I was uh, uh, brainwashed by Ethereum people back then uh, when they signing like uh, POS. Uh, that was the year 2017. And uh, Avatopu have been like operated since the 2013. And uh, basically we are two person business. Uh, my partner like take care of a customer support, uh, my minor relationship, this kind of talk to miners, and I just uh, running the servers. And uh, I oh, also, two people business. Yeah, two person business. Uh, until uh, 2016, we have a third guy join us uh, in October 2016, and since then uh, we start to consider to make a two person uh, small business like a real company. Uh, so we started to hire people in 2000, uh, 2017, and uh, by by, uh, by mid-2017, we started to have about 10 people uh, working in a small office. I actually, in the beginning, I, I didn't want to do this in China. Uh, so, uh, but the other two people, they uh, they have a pretty strong preference. I already moved to Thailand in 2015, so I rarely visit the office. Uh, in Beijing, uh, you know, so one day my partner uh, told me that uh, uh, we're going to move to a bigger office because there are too many people there. And his uh, wife says, uh, let's let's just move the office to a secret place without telling me. So that's what happened. And uh, yeah, so I started feel like, uh, yeah, I don't have to spend that much time like I handle every day, uh, pay out, you know, maintain the servers. So I started to think about something else. Actually, uh, second half of 2017, I gave myself a kind of a vacation of a few months. And uh, that's also the time like Bitcoin, like uh, become Bitcoin Cash, become Gold, become Diamond, become this, become that. And uh, I was thinking what's next. So I got uh, some talk with the Ethereum people. And uh, yeah, so a lot of them sending me uh, staking, staking pool. So I started to think about something like staking related. But uh, meanwhile, I got a new domain name. I suggested uh, my partner at uh, Aptopu. Maybe, yeah, I just secure domain name that you wanted for long, you know. And uh, maybe you can do something uh, using this domain. So I didn't know what to do now with that domain. But uh, yeah, so just I haven't got domain name to find some good use of it. So that was bit.fish, and uh, yeah, so we started something, it's bit.fish, and uh, in Bangkok, we got an office, and uh, even though I didn't know what to do, I invested like, uh, how much, uh, maybe 10, 10 million Thai baht, and uh, just to decorate the office. So 
So fortunately, we got a few interesting people joined us in the in the beginning. So that's how Stakefish. Yeah, we only figured out to do staking and rename from Bitfish to Stakefish uh, later, I think, in 2019. So uh, that's how we started because uh, I think it's mostly uh, we started from nothing. We start, started from uh, no idea, I must say. Yeah, just got friendly, uh, uh doing something. Yeah, so yeah. But now we know like uh, Stakefish is here. You know, I think that's also uh, have a lot of components like what I used to be like uh, doing Bitcoin, doing mining, and uh, for stake fish is kind of uh, doing similar thing to Ethereum and the POW combined with POS. We kind of secure the Bitcoin infrastructures with good things. You know, uh, I think that's super uh, important to the ecosystem because there are gonna be uh, eventually someone to talk to the P2P network to create a new blocks. And without uh, people like uh, doing this, the blockchain is just simply stuck. Uh, if you see, uh, uh, we've got uh, you know developers, they 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 write full node, but uh, our role is much like uh, DevOps. We run infrastructures. So uh, to make a system going, don't just need developers. You also need people like uh, to uh, maintain the infrastructure. And then, so you guys were. We're working on the Cosmos test nets. I get was that your first network where you guys went live or Yes, Cosmos was the first network because they kind of uh, early in the staking. And uh, despite uh, people talking about Ethereum these days, uh, seems like Ethereum become a, uh, just a tomorrow. But uh, we still have no idea when it becomes QS when it's getting merged. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious with Ethereum, like I, I mean a lot of people right have uh, you know, in the, in the last years, right, we've had a lot of other layer ones come up, right? We had Solana, Cosmos, so, you know, Cosmos, I guess, uh, maybe many layer ones, depending how you look at it, you know, Polkadot, Near, and many others. Now, you seem to be, like, very uh, Ethereum-focused, no? I'm curious, yeah, like... I'm Bitcoin-focused. <laughs> you're Bitcoin-focused? Yes. Because I heard you in an I heard you. I listened to this interview you did with the staking wars guys, and in there you basically were like, "Oh, once Ethereum switches to proof of stake, that like that's 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 like the most important thing." And yeah, how do you think about that? How do you think about the role of Ethereum and like the competition from other layer ones? I think Ethereum is still have the best team, to be honest. And uh, uh, what you mentioned uh, previously, I think at least in short time, this is. Uh, Probably no one can challenge the same position. Also, like you know, when people are talking of flips, I don't think even like Ethereum one day once its uh, valuations, uh, uh, there might be a chance like Ethereum could challenge Bitcoin in terms of valuation. But I think there's uh, no chance that Ethereum will challenge Bitcoin in terms of uh, decentralization and in terms of uh, uh, the people like uh, accept it. Yeah. Mm. Invest in uh, what you mentioned, Solana near uh, just like uh, sim to me is similar to like invest in uh, uh, new startup companies, but invest in Bitcoin is like invest in you know in freedom in in in, in the future and uh, that's have a fundamental difference. When you talk about decentralization of like Bitcoin versus Ethereum, what do you think are the things that make Bitcoin like fundamentally more decentralized? Uh, it's because uh, how they work. You know, Ethereum, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, these packs have been like uh, much much better compared to a few years ago. It still like have a central. I must say, still have a centralized planning. And one, you know, the decisions, uh, how, how decision making and uh, how it's uh, you know the everything is organized. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess you're wearing right the UASF hat right uh, now probably most listeners will not remember this because it's many years ago right but there was the so this stands for right user activated soft fork which was the the big debate there was in bitcoin where you know some people wanted to increase the block size right and they were like okay look we need more throughput we need more space and others were basically uh, against this and uh and and I think well there was a lot of different arguments used. But lately we have another another debate going on. 
as uh, people from and I, and uh, uh, rather than UASF, people started to talk about uh, URSF, and uh, that's the opposite side of UASF, but uh, I think the philosophy is kind of uh, similar. When you think about like the future of proof of stake, do you, do you think like proof of stake is kind of pretty established in how it works? So do you think we're going to see a lot of changes and in innovation and in new types of staking mechanisms and protocols? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But once again, I think all this is, uh, you know, it's uh, startup companies. And there's a uh, hundred, maybe a thousand reasons a startup company go wrong, such like what you happen, what you see, what happened to uh, Solana. You know, uh, I think they have uh, some, you know, a lot of headache to keep the network going, and uh, maybe yeah, I, I think they have a chance like to get a problem fixed. But you know, as I mentioned, like invest in a altcoin, a smaller coin, just like invest in a startup company. For sure, like if you if you do it right, you can you can get a, a reward maybe a hundred times, one thousand times. But it's, you know uh, things could go wrong, and there's there's one thousand reasons things could go wrong. So when you think of like the future of proof of stake, what are do you think the kind of dimension in which things will change? I think for stake future, we probably have a two kind of system going on simultaneously. Uh, one is uh, we still will keep running validators, we'll keep like drawing the governance uh, in good things, and uh, we'll operate uh, uh, as much networks, uh, I mean good reputation ones as possible. And uh, I would say like uh, just to check uh, our portfolio, like uh, our website, and you can safely say like you, you, you buy every coin we listed on Stakefish, and you can expect good uh, profit, uh, good uh, good reward, and uh, that's what we're doing. Like trying to uh, support all, all the uh, good, uh, reputed, and good innovative uh, uh, coins uh, in POS world. Uh, actually, we were doing similar uh, on after proof of POW as well, but uh, unfortunately, there's not much innovation these days on POW world. So we keep the delisting coins on uh, after pool. Currently, we still have 21 coins, uh, include uh, much many ones. Uh, but I think maybe there are only uh, uh, there will be more delist uh, the uh, listing new ones. POS uh, still like have a lot of uh, innovations. I'm not sure like if uh, the real bear market coming, uh, what will happen, or what kind of impact to the to the ecosystem. But I think yeah. I still like to pack a lot of innovations in POS and in layer one. What kind of innovation do you expect? If you ask the serious ask, ask me, I don't think innovation layer one is a good idea, you know. Just like what I am using like uh, iPhone and some other people use Android. Just think about this. If it's a star someone start a, a entire new uh, operating mobile operating system, such like uh, Microsoft uh, uh, mobile, Windows Mobile previously. Even even Microsoft cannot do it well, you know. Uh, we have uh, Ethereum, we have Bitcoin, kind of have a, you know, entire ecosystem around these two uh, major net layer one networks. And uh, if someone has start something new, then you have to start a complete new ecosystem around it. Uh, you can imagine how hard it is to to, to do it. But do you see, do you see when you think of like steak fish in the future, do you think like, okay, it's basically like, you know, running validators for different chains, you know, participating in governance. Like if you, if you project like five years from now, 10 years from now, what do you think? I guess that will still be there, right? Probably we still have proof of stake chains. They'll still need like people who like run nodes, verify the transactions, create the blocks. They'll need people to doing governance, but what changes? Uh, I didn't mention Ethereum. Ethereum is not part of this. Uh, Ethereum will kind of, uh, you know, separate editing products around Ethereum. We we'll probably invest uh, more than uh, half of our uh, effort only on Ethereum. You probably see a new, a new Ethereum start a staking service uh, after a few months and uh, with Stakefish. Yeah, I have heard of that. But th so tell us about this Ethereum staking service. Like, wh what does it look like? 
Uh, I think we'll probably do is uh, compared to other competitors. I, I don't see them as competitors because they are doing it differently. Uh, we won't repeat other what other people are doing. Lido is kind of become a monopoly in this days in Ethereum staking service. It's not healthy to the ecosystem. Uh, but what we are doing is we're doing uh, infrastructure level things. So we'll probably uh, do something a lot more like uh, uh, lower level. And if you still want to have ownership, your own uh, validators and Maybe you can, you can, you know, check it out. So yeah, like let's say if I, I'm someone who has ETH and I want to stake, I could go to Lido, right? I could put it there, uh, in, but for whom would the uh, stake fish product be better? Because we are running a lower level, you can have take ownership of your own validator. And, uh, what Lido doing is a kind of finance product, but what we doing is provide the infrastructure. Uh, it's much like uh, you buy a, a cloud server and uh, you can run whatever application on it. Uh, we are kind of uh, selling you uh, a server, a product, uh, kind of uh, a, a platform. Uh, Lido, what they're doing is uh, they offer finance products. They're trying to tokenize Ethereum staking and give you good uh, profit, good, good APY. Uh, it's totally different. Yeah, okay. But do you, I mean, right now, right, we're seeing Lido having, you know, enormous growth. Uh, do you think this is gonna, cause your product is not a liquid staking product, right? Like you don't have a tokenized, uh, no, not yeah. uh, tokenized today. Doesn't mean like we won't tokenize tomorrow. I, I do think like, uh, have a token represent a editor, probably something like, uh, useful to, uh, to, to the service. Do you think like when we talk about Lido and liquid staking, do you think Lido's market share is going to keep going up? Or do you think that uh, more people after the merge will stake uh, maybe running their own validators or like a product like yours? I cannot make prediction for Lido what they perform. Uh, we are kind of have a pretty close relationship. Like working we are like uh, one of the five funding infrastructure providers to Lido. Uh, we still support them very well, and but I think uh, what we're gonna do is a completely different layer of things. We are not uh, competitors. Uh, we kind of uh, just uh, provide different solutions to the same thing. One one thing I'd also love to talk a little bit about, which you know seems to be something that could change proof of stake a lot, which is MEV. What are your thoughts on MEV and like? How how do you think Stakefish will deal with uh, MEV in the future? I think it's completely separate. Uh, uh, you know, this you can write a uh, you know uh, entire book like just to talk about this topic. Uh, but the thing is, uh, at Apple Pool, we're already doing this. Uh, we're already doing it for uh, almost a year. I think maybe you can reuse the expertise like uh, gained from. Uh, to pool and try to see like uh, what kind of difference and I think most mostly it's uh, kind of similar uh, when it's applied to staking just the underlying uh, consensus uh, change uh, but I think uh, you are right I mean it's critical to as a validator and if you want to do uh, staking well then you cannot ignore I mean we yeah I get I guess maybe I should should like add a few words to our listeners who may not be that familiar with MEV. Actually, we did do a podcast like a few weeks back where me and Felix, also from course one, we talked about MEV in a bit more detail, but on a high level, right? It's basically because the validator can decide on the order of transactions in the block and there's value in, in that order, right? So there's a sort of value extractable. I can share with you guys like uh, today after pool, uh, actually, uh, Ethereum takes the, uh, uh, eighty percent of uh, after pool profit. Uh, the reason is because of MEV. Uh, when Ethereum become a POS, uh, I, I'm not sure like if after pool could stay, uh, <laughs> could survive or not. So okay, so eighty percent of profits are on after pool from MEV. And do you guys just run yeah, from, from Ethereum? Yeah, yeah, from Ethereum. And do you guys just run flashbots there? Or do you guys do something else? Uh, there's a uh, different solutions, but uh, lately we changed back to flashbots. And so, but you, you did you also like develop some of your own things and then? Yes. 
How do you think this is going to play out even after the merge? Do you think something like flashbots is just going to be adopted by, you know, like everyone or, you know, a lot of different validators will have their own solutions? Yeah, I, th I think uh, flashbots have a, a great team. So it definitely would like to support flashbots. Uh, but uh, there should be some space, uh, you know, this uh, big market. I think uh, we are always welcome to new competitors. Yeah, if, uh, yeah, I think we also invest some time to do it in-house. And of course, NEV is also like a controversial topic, right? Where people will be like, oh, but this is like maybe bad for the chain or maybe it causes like centralization. Uh, how, how do you think about that? How do you think about, uh, you know, are there negative effects of MEV and what do you think they are? I, I don't think so. To me, it's not controversial at all because the uh, coded law, if you if you believe coded law, then it's not controversial at all. It's, uh, yeah, it's a permitted by code. And yeah, why it's controversial? Why it's not good? Right. Although code is law, of course, even Ethereum, right? That, you know, you're, you're yeah, like... If you think right. MEV is bad, then change the code. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Although, of course, that line is kind of, you know, even the Ethereum community, right? Like when it came to the DAO hack many years ago, then they were like, okay, now actually in this case, code isn't law. And you had this social consensus that made the change there and kind of reverted this. So I would say even in the, even in the crypto community, you know, like people hacking some smart contracts stealing funds, right? Then they're like, well, that's a crime. That's not okay. Yeah, that's a crime. That's a crime, but... <laughs> but then you don't think the line is blurry because if you have something like a sandwich attack, like you make some trade and then I'm, I'm basically sort of like doing something that results in you getting a worse outcome. Uh, now, okay, maybe not a crime, but... I mean, I, I kind of agree, right? In the end, you can say with MEV, if, if you assume that people are just going to basically uh, kind of run an algorithm, right? That maximizes the profits of each block. And then it's the job of like whoever's building the application on top to like build an application so that the users of the application don't like lose money knowing that the validators are going to kind of run this maximizing function over it. Like that kind of makes sense, I think. Yeah. And all this law is not uh, kind of that uh, absolute because uh, there's a lot of law in this world. Uh, some law, they are good law. Some laws are not good. Like uh, get your COVID test every day is also the law, you know. But uh, uh, legal and uh, uh, legit, uh, legitimate is, uh, is different. Something, you know, it's uh, legal, but it doesn't mean like, uh, you know, you should like, it's, it's, it's uh, legitimate. And uh, just like uh, in Afghanistan, you, you have to get mask. And uh, in other countries, you know, uh, but I think like uh, there's something universal and uh, I kind of, you know, not just, uh, you know, blindly to just uh, follow uh what we uh we told to we kind of need to always challenge this good good law or this is bad law you know there are always a bad law bad law in like uh, you know bad code that's uh the, sometimes it's, you know the programmers they, they they write you know they write code which has bugs that's just been like uh, that's also law you know but uh, uh that probably is a bad law bad law could happen there's some discussion, I think, in Ethereum, you knowing like separating the role of whoever kind of creates the block uh, with the one who then kind of validates the block. And can can you maybe explain that? Like, what's the thinking behind this, and what are your thoughts on on this direction? I like this idea, but uh, didn't say like uh, they separate uh, who creates uh, the block and who edits the block. But it didn't say like uh, it didn't uh, forbid anyone like who like uh, takes the post role. You know, you can the same group of people who can uh, create a blog who can also write a blog. 
And, and so is there still a benefit to the Ethereum proposal if that happens? Yes, that's a make the, I think that's make the Ethereum the most decentralized and also uh, prevent, uh, you know, kind of a too big monopoly. Well, let's talk, let's talk about another topic that uh, I saw you mentioned somewhere, you know, you mentioned that you were very interested in humans becoming a multi-planetary species. So uh, why are you excited about that? Like, it's not about exciting or not. It's something like if a human ever survive this, you know, this universe, it has to be. And when human become multi uh, planetary and uh, the currency they use have to be multi planetary as well. Just a thing for this, everything has to be multi planetary. Uh, heading to a quite an exciting future, and they probably much time. Maybe you can see that uh, within our lifetime. So are you also personally, do you have like uh, the wish that someday to, you know, I don't know, visit Mars or like other planets or do you maybe, maybe do you plan on moving there? You might find uh, like... I've been living in Martian time zone uh, for some time already. And that's the one reason why I like to live in Svalbard because here we have 24 hour daytime. You can live whatever, you know, you, you like, you know, uh, on Mars is uh, one day is uh, 24 hours, uh, 39 uh, minutes and uh, uh, 35 seconds. So uh, it's kind of uh, today you wake up uh, maybe 6 a.m. Tomorrow you wake up uh, 6.40 and you can only do this uh, in Svalbard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually thinking about this topic as well, you know, uh, before I think I was like doing some hi hiking last year and I was also thinking about, okay, but now if you had Mars, like how would you work with the cryptocurrency, right? Because of course the big challenge, I guess, is that you have a long, you know, information takes a long time to travel, right, between places. So well, how, how do you think, well, what do you think is the best solution to create a multi-planetary cryptocurrency. I hope that Bitcoin takes that role. Bitcoin has to evolve a little bit uh, to take that role, but I hope that eventually it will be Bitcoin. I think for somewhat, uh, maybe I kind of understand, trying to understand uh, like uh, what Luke Junior, the Bitcoin core developer, trying to propose uh, when the debate like uh, happening in terms of scaling. Some people wanted to have uh, to enlarge the block size. But uh, basically, only Luke Journey proposed like we should act not to enlarge the block size, but to, to reduce it. Maybe we should we should halving it you know, to like a <laughs> half a megabyte. Yeah, if you if you want to have a Bitcoin like uh, using for interplanetary settlement, I think not necessarily a bad idea to reduce the block size. And also, I think we need to change the consensus to make it more. You you do not want to like only have people on the earth to have a privilege to, to mine Bitcoin, to make the truly decentralized to be like a separate, like uh, regarding to your uh, planet, which planet you live on. And uh, I think, you know, uh, Martians should be able to mine Bitcoin as well. So would you just increase the block time to like 24 hours or what? Or how would you change the consensus? Mm, that, that that doesn't solve the problem, you know. It's uh, probably temporarily solve the problem if we increase the block span, but uh, I think there's uh, other consensus algorithm is possible to handle this matter. Uh, just uh, we probably need uh, a serious uh, fork. I'm not sure it's possible to do self fork, but uh, we need a fork. Uh, so what would this consensus algorithm look like? It could be like, uh, just like uh, a, you know, instead of uh, a uh, block, one block next to another, we can make a graph. And uh, uh, Earth have, uh, you know, Earth can generate blocks and Mars can generate blocks. Sometimes uh, they sparsely like, uh, you know, just doing this. So sometimes they basically kind of like sync or like how would it work? Like, uh, you can you can generate block uh, based on Earth's block or you can generate block based on Mars block. That could be kind of a graph. Yeah, okay. And then you'd have Mars miners, but then it's kind of like Mars has its own little like mining 
uh, thing, and Earth has its kind of mining thing. So like mining on Mars, you can also mining on astronauts. You can mining. Uh, you can create a Dyson sphere. Uh, people argue like uh, Bitcoin uses too much energy. Is uh, I think uh, I must say uh, p- those people kind of uh, they have a valid viewpoint, but I think it's a little bit you know short sighted. Like you know because. Uh, the total energy in the, our universe is in, in, infinite, and it all depends how you find those energy. Yeah. You can you can you can build a Dyson sphere like uh, you know for mining Bitcoin and also for other uses. And uh, if a Bitcoin has uh, enough value to support to, to start a such a project, and we have such a project kicks off, and uh, that will benefit our whole uh, society. That's an isolated de- development. I mean, when I, when I was thinking about the Mars, uh, the Mars problem, the, the thing that stood out to me actually was that IBC, you know, the kind of Cosmos interoperability protocol, that feels like it should work really well, you know, because like if you have a chain on Earth, and now I want to transfer money to, and let's say we have a proof of stake chain on Mars. You have a proof, you have chains on Earth. Now you can make a transaction from Earth to say like, oh, I want to send it to Mars chain, right? It gets, it goes in the block here. Now headers are synced, right? With the Mars chain, but it doesn't matter if it takes like, you know, an hour or like it takes some time. And then, uh, you know, like you can basically have, have this IBC packet, like put executed in the other chain, you can move coins over and then you can have a fast proof of stake chain here, fast proof of stake chain there. You don't need anybody to, you know, I guess the challenge with, with some of the other bridge protocols, like, I guess like wormhole and it is like, you know, the, the operators are running full node on both chains and watching both chains. Well, but that doesn't work so well, right? Because now you have chain on Mars, chain on earth. I don't think that there's a solution, but uh, uh, here, like, uh, you know, I think Mars is a major planet in our uh, solar system. It has to be a currency used there. It, should, it must not be a security or company coin uh, using there. It could be Mars coin. No. Yeah, if, uh, I mean, if, uh, you know, Starship project going well, it's, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I probably won't be, you know, I probably won't like to see Mars uh, as a SpaceX uh, company planet, you know, it will be a uh, public society. Just like here is uh, it's kind of uh, uh, a few decades ago, it kind of like a mining company uh, town, but it's very slowly is turned into a real public town. I'm not sure like uh, Mars will like uh, go in a similar way, but uh, uh, I hope Mars will become like a public uh, planet uh, sooner, not later. Yeah. I mean, of course, another option would be that you have a proof of stake s- side chain on Mars. So you could use, you could move Bitcoin over and then you would use like proof of stake chain to make the transaction within. That's possible, but it's not ideal. That's, uh, that's kind of uh, a, I think I see that kind of temporary solution, but uh, uh, it's far from uh, a ideal solution, you know. Because the idea is like that you have Bitcoin consensus actually be able. Yeah, because they make the Earth. They still make the Earth a central, central, central point of failure. Because you see Mars like a side trend, you know. But this this planet should be like political neutral, political eco. Right, right, right. That's a very interesting problem. How how can you make Bitcoin? Yeah, you have the solution, and to make a Bitcoin like uh, for interplanetary solution uh, settlement, uh, but to make uh, maybe another uh, could be Bitcoin side chain, could be uh, other trends for like local use, especially when it's uh, how uh, you know take uh, asteroids in consideration. Some asteroids probably just like private ones. And they can they can use whatever they want, uh, so long they connect to the uh, interplanetary settlement settlement networks. And I think we shouldn't bother like them to like uh, for anything. Cool. Okay, then. Well, Jun, thank you so much for coming on. It was like a really pleasure to speak with you. I mean, I'm a great uh, admirer, right? Also of your work with Steakfish and. Uh, 
I don't know how you could. Do not, do not see F2 for like a side company. It's not. <laughs> I mean, after, after, after POW become POS, I think F2 pool will be focused on Bitcoin. Uh, F2 basically will be like a Bitcoin company and uh, we'll make F2 for a Bitcoin company. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a lot of things for Bitcoin. No, I'm, uh, that sounds great too. I'm just saying, especially if, uh, Stakefish, because I'm much more familiar with the proof of stake and deeply involved in the proof of stake ecosystem. But of course, uh, it's very crucial to have Bitcoin thrive as well. And I'm excited that you're thinking about how to evolve Bitcoin, make it multi planetary. Now, I guess challenge is going to be, okay, how do you get some kind of hard fork or fundamental change into Bitcoin? Because right, that is like very, very difficult. Yeah, definitely possible if I have a consensus, but you know, if one day I have no choice but to make a hard fork, I think a hard fork will happen. Okay, well, thanks so much, June, for coming on. Uh, I'm excited to see where you're going to take Stakefish, F2 Pool, and, and sort of where this conversation evolves around crypto and uh, humans on other planets. I think that's going to be... Actually, I don't know if you've spoken about this on this podcast before. Maybe it's the first time. I'm not sure. But I'm sure it's not going to be the last time because I think that's going to end up being like a very important conversation, you know, in the next decade, two decades, as this kind of slowly starts to or, or, or quickly starts to uh, progress. Yeah, for sure. All right. So thanks so much, Shun, and thanks so much for, for our listeners for tuning in. Thank you for your support and we look forward to seeing you next week.